that usually when I give the last talk in a conference, I thank the audience for sticking around while well, you guys didn't have a choice. <laughs> we got your, your plane tickets. Um, how many people have actually written a proposal or helped write a proposal or something? So uh, mo more than not, and I think that's a trend over the years that students are getting more and more uh, involved. And so this is, you know, we've told you all about these great beam lines and everything, and it's a little bit like telling you, well, we got a great applications like Google and Facebook, but we didn't tell you how to buy a computer or connect it to the internet. So these beam lines aren't going to do you a lot of good unless you actually have access to them. And the access, the, the success rate of proposals is less than 50%, and it varies a lot. Sometimes it's one in five. So you, uh, it's worth putting some effort into the proposals and knowing how do you get beam time. So uh, there are really no equations, uh, and it's motivated by the fact that scientists spend a lot of time writing proposals, reviewing proposals, giving presentations, and getting funding. And way back when I was uh, in grad school, there was one course that dealt with this kind of stuff. It was a guy, taught by a guy, Bob Richardson, who later won a Nobel Prize, but it was the least scientific in terms of technical details. He told us technical techniques and things like that, but the big projects were like writing a proposal to get funding. That was an exercise. Or uh, reviewing uh, papers. We spent a lot of time reviewing other papers and things like that. So when you're a scientist, you actually have to do a lot of that stuff. I mean, if you notice, your advisor doesn't go in, in the lab all that much. He actually has, spends a lot of time writing things, writing proposals. So that's the motivation uh, for this talk. And so hopefully it's useful. And so I want to start with a, an old joke. Uh, Neutron walks into a bar and asks how much for a drink. Uh, it's been attributed to Sheldon Cooper, but I think it predates him. So what's the answer? <laughs> right. The bartender replies, for you, no charge. So that's the good news is supposedly user facilities are free for the users. You come here and you don't actually pay a fee in thinking what you're getting for not paying a fee. Well, what I claim is that free, no charge is fake news. <laughs> So really, you do need to get beam time, you need to get travel funding, all this kind of stuff, but even more importantly, more than half of the DOE BES budget is for constructing and operating these user facilities. And so money is important, funding, and I'll give you a little bit of feel for how that works in DOE. So just as a rough ballpark idea, the operating budget for the SNS is $200 million a year. They have about 1,000 experiments, so it's about 200K per experiment. So if you think about that, that doesn't include the over a billion dollars to build it to begin with. So this is really a pretty valuable resource, and they don't just give it to you. They expect you to do a lot of work, work hard, be prepared, uh, publish papers, all that kind of stuff. So keep that in mind. That's kind of on the order of a typical university professor grant for his year, for his whole group. So that 200K uh, is a big motivation. So. Uh, first, I want to just tell you about all, there are lots of different options, and so you probably have heard of most of these light sources, uh, including CHESS run by NSF, uh, neutron sources, NIST uh, run by Department of Commerce. Uh, there are also five DOE nanoscience centers that you may have heard about that are generally connected with major national labs. Uh, and there's DOE electron microscopy centers that they have just been merged and into the nanoscience centers. So these are many different kinds of user facilities that are available to you that are all worth knowing about. And there's other kinds of user facilities that aren't even scattering facilities or electron microscopy or nanoscience facilities. There's 36 EFRCs, they're energy frontier research centers. They're more like projects and funding mechanisms, a few million dollars a year. Some of you actually are funded on EFRCs. And there's four sort of hubs that are super EFRCs. They're like $20 million a year. Uh, there's one at Oak Ridge on uh, nuclear uh, power uh, future developments. And so there's also advanced scientific computing centers like NERSC. That's a very good resource for doing uh, DFT, big calculations, things like that. Uh, there are also NSF uh, facilities, uh, high, National High Magnet Field Lab in Florida, uh, CHESS, Nanotech. There's various, there's lots of options, and so finding out about them is part of becoming a scientist, um, and it's a big resource, and it's sort of a different way of getting funding. I mean, it's still very important, and it really is a lot of money, but it's not through your regular grant, usually. And all the national labs are also home to many other user facilities. Uh, so obviously you know about Hyper SNS and probably the CNMS, the Nanophase Material Science Center, but there's lots of other ones like carbon fiber technology, building technologies, 
uh, structural mo molecular biology, all these things. So I guess I would recommend just going to uh, Google and try a search of the national labs in your area and see what they got. They might have some kind of facility that it may not be exactly your area, but they may have some kind of technique of scanning probe techniques or something that would be very useful to your research. And they want to bring in users. That's how they get rated is by how many users they have. So they're generally very open to having uh, collaborations and working with people. And it's even worldwide. So obviously, science has gone global. Uh, the X-ray and neutron sources are available worldwide. I guess I'm, even I'm kind of surprised that there are 61 light source facilities around the world. And so there's a nice resource at lightsources.org or neutronsources.org that gives some of the statistics and the addresses and things like that and what the capabilities of various uh, beam lines around the world. So obviously, the big ones for synchrotrons are ESRF and Spring 8. Uh, Petra 3 in Germany, but there's lots of uh, newer ones that aren't usually quite as big. They fill different niches for energy regimes and things like that. And particularly in China and Asia, there's a big growth lately of uh, uh, synchrotron sources and also uh, free electron lasers are becoming more and more of those. There's actually 13 free electron lasers around the world. Um, same thing for neutron sources. There's actually 50 research centers around the world for neutrons. It's particularly big in uh, Germany. Uh, ILL is the other big one uh, in Europe. Uh, J Park in Japan, ISIS in the UK, and China is building a spallation neutron source that should come online pretty soon. And I guess one thing I would say, sort of politically, about these is very interesting. Where can you get beam time? Uh, it's actually pretty tough to get beam time at ESRF for an American somebody from America or even from an American institution, even if you're a European citizen, because it's funded by a consortium of European countries. They're all fighting with each other about getting beam time, and they don't really want to give it to other people. Whereas the ones like are just funded by Germany or England, internal country ones are much more open. They're usually open to anybody putting in proposals. So you have to know where can you get beam time, where can you not. But that's a general rule of thumb that seems to be true. Uh, how do we get all these facilities? So I thought I'd give you a little bit of background of how this and give you a feel that it's not really so well defined. How do we get here? And in the future, there will be lots of de uh, decisions to be made, and hopefully you guys will be involved in making those decisions. So way back when I was a grad student, back in the prehistory, uh, was back when NSLS was the first uh, f facility that really was a dedicated. So actually, when I was a grad student, uh, SSRL and CHESS were just becoming uh, user facilities. And I worked at CHESS and actually had my own beam line for two years because we were just setting it up and I became a beam line scientist as a grad student. <laughs> Got paid minimum wage to help people do experiments. So that was sort of the precursor to having these big user facilities. And then NSLS was the first real dedicated synchrotron built to do that. And it took an extra two years to come online. I had a postdoc. I was supposed to work there, but it didn't work. So we went to SSRL still. Um, but then it, it, when I came here, it worked. Oak Ridge ran a beam line at NSLS. It was very good. It was a success. And so then over the years, DOE has now spent typically about $200 million a year on building new machines. And so there's a cycle. So here's where ALS was built. Here's where APS was built. Here's where SNS was built, LCLS, NSLS2 just came online. And so this is the way they, they fund things, and it's continuing. It's been growing the percent of the budget. So here's more recent. Here's SNS, LCLS, NSLS2. Now here's the upgrade uh, or the building of LCLS2 right here. Here's the APS upgrade that's been kind of bumping along at 20 million and probably will explode up here. So how does this all happen? And it's a little bit like if you like sausage, you eat it, you try not to think about how it's made. But the process of getting there to getting the machines is actually pretty complicated and a little bit messy. But it, you know, I don't know a better way to do it. But right now, uh, there's several uh, projects vying for what is the next generation of things. And there's sort of a fixed amount of money. And neutrons and x-rays are uh, both cooperating and competing. And so uh, LCLS2, high energy upgrade, they want to build that. The next is the NSLS2 experimental, uh, more beam lines here. APS upgrade, you may have heard about that, the ultra bright multi band acromat kind of a technique uh, developed in uh, MAX4. Uh, that probably will happen pretty soon. SNS wants to have a second target station and a power upgrade, uh, get uh, cold neutrons. 
Uh, there's, so there's basically a lot of evaluations going on. There's arguments, and it, ch it actually can change even when they've made some decisions. They thought they were going to build uh, a uh, next generation uh, fast breeder reactor here, and they, that, they dug the, the hole in the ground and stopped. The superconducting super collider, DOE built, you know, leveled out the ground and then stopped. So these things are not cast in concrete, but they have to go through these critical decisions. So if, if you ever hear people talk about CD0, CD1, CD2, these are the formal steps that DOE has to go through with the government to get a proposal and then go through a cost ranging performance baseline. And you only by the time you get the CD3 do you start construction. So it's a very formal process and uh, DOE go, has lots of panels for scientists have lots of impact and give recommendations to, for this to happen. So as far as the funding for these things, uh, as I said, over the 30 years, this is the part that's really grown. This is the DOE uh, BES budget's about $2 billion and facilities is almost half and the construction for the facility is a little bit more. So that's more than half right there. This is more the, what you think of as core science like material science and chemistry, uh, EFRC basic research uh, over here. So you can tell this really is a big part of it. And so the users here use these facilities and that's where they get, if you think of it as a 200K experiment, you're really getting as much money from here as you are here if you're using the facilities as, a, you know, as your, one of your main tools. So as, as these facilities have grown uh, and been more available, there's been a huge growth in the users, uh, makes sense. And so here's NSLS and it stopped in the end of 2014 and NSL2 starting to ramp up here. Here's SSRL, ALS, APS. So you can see the synchrotrons have a lot more users. It's on the order of 10,000 users a year for synchrotrons. The neutron sources have fewer users, but they're also growing. So now with the SNS and LCLS, I mean, uh, Hyfer up here. Um, so, um, and also the, uh, most of these are connected with uh, one of these uh, nanoscience centers and, uh, and there's sort of a lot of users go through there also. So it's a little bit interesting to look at where the users come from. And so here's for light sources for the synchrotrons. It started out way back even before this, it was really hardcore uh, condensed matter physicists and they were used to complicated equipment and beam lines and X-ray optics and things like that. And so once the synchrotrons became useful uh, user facilities, basically the life sciences, these are the macromolecular crystallographers, things like that, really uh, became mo much more heavy users. They often just mail in their sample. They really crank through a lot and it's been a very uh, big help to their field. But that's kind of leveled out now. They have plenty of uh, beam lines and so that really isn't growing that much. And so this is what it's leveled out into the different areas of, uh, of science at this point. And as far as neutrons go, it's also growing with the years. You can tell back when SNS was built, it uh, wasn't very many users, and over the years it, it keeps growing. And so in 2016, it was about uh, 850 experiments done at uh, SNS and uh, 558 done at, at Hyfer. And here's where all the different users are from. So that's what I'm saying is that facilities that are in a certain country often let uh, users come from worldwide, but if it's a consortium of, com of countries that build it, they often don't let anybody else in. So, but what's really important to you guys is what's the subscription rate? How many people put in proposals and how many actually get the beam time? And so here's the statistics for uh, Hyfer and SNS for the last few years, and you can tell uh, this is 100% would be how many they can accept and get actually, uh, I mean, one to one. So that means that almost half got beam time at Hyfer, but only about a little bit less than one third got beam time at SNS. And so that's where the facilities usually like to have it about a factor of three or four oversubscribed. It makes them look very important. They're gonna keep getting funding, but for the user, it's not so fun. And especially if you're trying to get beam time on a beam line that's five times oversubscribed. So knowing which beam lines are available, how to get right a good proposal uh, in order to get beam time, that is very important. Neutron user committee uh, communities are a little bit different than x-rays. I'm sort of surprised that biology is only a little bit, uh, maybe 12%. There really aren't that many macromolecular crystallographers routinely using neutrons. And I guess it's uh, just the resolution and the time and the being able to make crystals and stuff is not 
as useful for neutrons. But I think biology and soft matter in general is kind of a growth area recently uh, with neutrons, and we'll, they're trying to increase that community uh, at this point. So now getting to the, the meat of it is how do you get beam time? How do you write a good? And so I'll try to give you some uh, what I've learned over 35 years of writing proposals and reviewing lots of proposals. So after you read a whole bunch of them, you kind of get an idea what is a good proposal, what's a bad proposal, and it's really nothing mysterious. I mean, it's, it's sort of common sense, but it's really worth thinking about it. And so all the DOE, NIST, and NSF, all these sources, the main mechanism is just general user proposals, but there are other options, and I'll tell you a little bit about those. The, they have an, a web-based application system, and different facilities have their own ways of doing things. So for example, APS and NSLS2 have three cycles per year, and they're very regular, uh, very well-defined. SNS and HIFR and ALS have only two times per year. And some of the other ones are a little bit more irregular, like NIST, they, they don't tell you ahead of time it's exactly this time, they just, whenever they decide to have a call, they'll have a call, it looks like. So anyway, the, all the proposals, this is a basic mechanism, they get peer-reviewed and rated, and they give you a score. And some places tell you your score, and some places don't. But, so there's different levels of transparency of the system to different places. And the beam time gets allocated using those scores, these reviews, but also with in, uh, input from the Beamline staff. So it's very important for the Beamline staff to know what you're doing, understand it, and talk to those guys. And once the beam time's been allocated, then you get to schedule your proposal uh, and actually get beam time. So at places like APS, uh, most of the beam lines provide 80 to 100% of their time to general users. When it first started up, it was CAT system. And so Oak Ridge, we actually had for ourselves about 75, 80% because we built the beam line. But they've been gradually changing that. Most of the beam lines have been taken over by the facility, and most of them are available for general user uh, proposals. Uh, SNS and HIFR, it differs by instrument a little bit, but typically it's at least 75% of the time will be used for general users. And so what those numbers, the fact that they're not 100% means that the Beamline staff has some of their own time, which they might, if they're collaborating with you, let you use some of them, or they may have their own projects or some development for the Beamline they want to use it for. But that's basically what happens at these different Beamlines. Uh, and so m almost all of them, they have a nice web page. You can go through each one, get the details uh, from online as a way to start looking at them. Uh, they each have uh, different cycles, like I said, and, and uh, lightsources.org used to have a, a link that uh, told you when the deadlines were, uh, but I went to it yesterday and it didn't seem to work for most facilities, so I wouldn't pay attention. I'd go directly to the facility webpage. And so like for the APS, it's coming up on October 27 every four months. Uh, and these are hard deadlines. Like APS, if you're 10 minutes late, it will automatically go bump to the next cycle. You might be able to call the user office and whine or something, but basically it's really a hard deadline. And so here's a little minor tip at APS that I've been on a lot of panels and there's a lot of times there's you know proposals that are almost exactly the same and you can say, which one should we pick? And we tend to favor the one that's been waiting longer. So if you put your proposal in early and get a number on it and then don't submit it for two months, you still have a lower number. It looks like it's an older proposal. So we actually have the case where we're sometimes, we're, well, they've been waiting longer. So it doesn't hurt to put your proposal in, get a number on it, and then uh, submit it two, two months later. So that's a, it, it, I mean, that's kind of a minor point, but those kind of things, how does the system work? That actually uh, is one of the details. So the way to actually get started is to read the inter instrument web page first. If you haven't actually used it or, t I mean, if you can visit the place and go talk to the beam, that's the best. And you guys hopefully have had an opportunity to do that. But this is, if there's any take home message at all from the talk is talk to the instrument scientist to discuss your research. Uh, a lot of the research, you know, proposals that don't look very good are because they don't really understand what the beam line can do or you know, there's some parameter they didn't take into account. The energy doesn't penetrate far enough or they don't have enough material or something. So what's your research problem? Which instruments are appropriate? You know, how mature is this? They don't mind high risk if it's high impact. What is the material? Uh, know, I mean, know what you want to do before you talk to them, get, but uh, generally Beamline staff are very happy to help you understand what they can do. What are the experimental conditions do you need? Do you need a temperature control or something? Do they have that easily available? Uh, what will we want to measure? 
what's your success? I mean, you know, how hard is it to measure? Is it high risk, high payoff, or is it, you know, just part of a, a, an ongoing project? Uh, how will the results be presented to whom? You know, what's your time frame? Things like that. I will say one of the things being on panels, one parameter fit is if this works, where will it be published? If it's going to be science or nature, if it works, then you get a better rating. If it's going to be a conference proceeding, even if it works, you may get a lower rating. So knowing what, what are you talking about, what are you trying to do, how important it is, uh, be ready to discuss that you know, with the uh, staff and put that in the proposal. Uh, so the instrument sciences uh, you know, help both the first time users and I, I mean, they're now my collaborators. I mean, every time I do experiment, I make sure I talk to the BeamLine staff before I, I go. So they know about the options uh, for samples, instruments, number of experimental days that's reasonable to put in. Uh, how do you get, transporting and storing samples is a bigger deal now. The safety issues at national labs are, uh, they're very careful about that. So you have to make sure you do that correctly. Um, they help you with proposals, uh, <clears throat> even data analysis. Beamlines are getting a lot better where they actually help you analyze the data, including even uh, theoretical calculations sometimes. So like at Vision, they'll help you do DFT uh, calculations. Um, so in general, what I would say is consider the Beamline staff as a collaborator and include them as co-authors if appropriate. And I guess from my personal experience, I really learned this a long time ago, back when NSLS was first starting to run. Uh, we were using X14 and we were doing an experiment with a colleague and uh, came back and nothing ran. The computer looked like it was shut off and everything. And we looked at it and these old RLL2s, I don't know if you guys know what, the, what these one megabyte LRL2 disks were, but they were taken out. And we said, what's going on? So eventually the computer scientist came back and said that he had noticed my colleague had written a draft of a paper from earlier work and didn't put his Beamline guy's name on it. And he thought he had done a lot of work on it. And he said, well, I guess you don't need my computer. And so uh, we learned that, yes, we, he's been collaborating. We need to be very sensitive to are they our collaborators or are they just running a Beamline and walk away and we turn it on? So think about that from their point of view also. And they're usually a very good resource because uh, they're, they're scientists too. They've seen lots of studies that are like your studies and they have usually have very good insight in the, as to what you know, uh, material, your material is doing and things like that. Uh, and also how to analyze data and lots of that. So I'd say, think about it. Don't just you know, kind of blow it off and think of, well, they just ran the beam line and turned it on for me. <clears throat> so when you actually submit the proposal, uh, all the facilities have a homepage and a link and they all have the same kind of information. Uh, you know, deadlines and, you know, it's called pass at NSLS and a user portal here and uh, these kind of things. So it's pretty obvious how to start out. Um, but there are different types of proposals that have some uh, facility f uh, flexibility. And so most of the places, it's just a general user proposal. Uh, so, but there are options. So there can be a rapid access beam time request. So if you had one in, and then later you want to get a rapid access, if something happened, you can do that. Uh, you can put one after the deadline um, as rapid access because this is really important. You just got a room temperature superconductor and if they let you measure it, they'll get really good publication out of it or something. There's also other bigger ones like partner user proposals. So if you're a group that really is involved in technique development, you can get a bigger you know, percent of the beam time, five or 10% of all their beam time to develop a new capability or something like that. Uh, rapid access, as I'm saying, after the deadline, you can run something quickly if it's quick and high impact. Uh, some beam lines, like 11BM powder, has uh, mail-in, so you, can, you don't even have to go. They send you a capillary tube, you put your powder in, you mail it to them, they give you the data. Uh, Chess and Cornell has a similar kind of thing with an express mode proposal. There's also a feasibility study. If you have an idea and just want to test it, Sometimes they can give you a half a day, one shift or something, just say, you know, is this uh, going to work? It may be hard to predict that. Uh, NSLS2 has shut down, I mean, NSLS has shut down and now it's NSLS2, and they had now have 17 beam lines now accepting general user proposals. And there's commissioning on some other beam lines, so that's an opportunity. If there's a technique that's just being commissioned now, you might be the guy to get in. They want to know how their beam line works, so they may let you come for a couple days and test out your sample in a real situation, you know, just uh, so you both uh, benefit from that. So they have general user discretionary, that's the beam. So all these usually have some discretionary beam time, where it's the staff to do whatever they want with. They may have their own experiment they want to do, but they may be open to some collaboration there. 
uh, partner user proposals. They're also proprietary. If you're at a company and you don't want to publish it, you can actually pay for the beam time. And they like to have industrial users also. Uh, there's rapid access at most of these. Um, here at SNS and uh, Heifer, there's mo majority of the proposals are these one cycle. That, that's the difference between uh, APS is APS has aging of your proposal. It lasts for two years, whereas SNS and Heifer are one shot. It's done with that cycle. Uh, but they also have some a thing called programmatic that allows more than one cycle. So, for example, your thesis, if you know you're going to need two or three short visits spread over a couple of years, it is actually possible to put in a programmatic uh, you know, proposal and not have to put the same thing and hope you get, you know, take one experiment then not get it at the beam time the next time might be a problem if you're trying to write your thesis. Uh, they do have mail-in powder for PowGen, Nomad, and Vision. Uh, there's same kind of feasibility type thing for up to one day for proof of principle, or there's actually a sample alignment beam line. If you're using one of the other beam lines, you just want to line up your sample, there's a Lowy instrument there, and rapid access uh, can be submitted anytime if you've got a, a hot new discovery. So it's worth knowing about these, that most of the things happen with the general user, but it's worth knowing that if you have a special case, those things are available. They try to be flexible and give the beam time to what's most useful. Uh, NIST and uh, their Neutron, they also have a powder diffractometer for mail-in and a quick access uh, me method there. In general, the macro molecular and crystallography uh, community is usually a self-contained separate community. They have their own reviewers, their own control of beam lines and stuff, so it's really kind of separate. Um, and there, the beam time is relatively available. So. Uh, if you have a real crystallography problem, you may actually want to talk to them because you actually could do crystallography on another uh, uh, one of those kind of beam lines. So the forms, when you actually go through, it sounds like most of you have actually seen this, but there's the, the you know they ask very similar questions, and the basic idea is what are you going to do and prove to us that you know how you're going to do it. And so you start with a title, general information about it. Uh, an abstract scientific importance. So I would say the two things that are most important are what's the scientific importance of the proposed research? Because when the panel sits down and tries to rate and compare between very different projects, they're going to say, which one is most important? Why do you need this facility to do this? So the uniqueness is very important also. Neutrons versus x-rays or maybe neutron flux x-rays are needed. Uh, you know, are you, is this the facility that you really need to use? I mean, or would some other scanning probe or electron microscopy technique be just as good for you? Uh, why do you need this particular beam line? So it's worth knowing uh, what the beam lines can do, because if you ask for the wrong beam line, they're going to say, well, we can't even do that here. What previous experiments or results do you have? That actually counts a lot, too. It's not supposed to so much, but your track record does count. So if you have some high-impact publications already from that facility, they're going to be more likely to give you more beam time. Uh, describe the proposed experiments with samples. And, with, and so that's the tricky part. You need to give them enough details that show you're ready, you know what you're doing, but don't swamp them with details. So I'm going to measure this concentration, then this concentration, this, and all the details, they get really bored because the reviewers don't really want to read unnecessary details, but they want to know that you know what you're doing. And you have to justify the amount of time that's required. And I would say don't be greedy or unrealistic. So if you think if I ask for three times as much and maybe they'll give me you know, only uh, two times as much as I need, that'll be good. No, what it means is the reviewer will get, this guy's unreasonable, I'm going to cut him down just to teach him a lesson or something. So I would say really try to be realistic and find out how much beam time should this take and, and what is normal on this beam line. So the general information, you know, you may get a, uh, I, don't know, I can't quite read these, but a proposal type and uh, various things like that, titles, abstract. So uh, you guys probably have seen most of that. So I'd say pick a good title, uh, something specific to the point. If they're reading you know, 25 or 30 proposals, they want to know what are you talking about. Uh, so something out of a study on valence under pressure, and you know, understanding superconductivity and superconductors just sounds you know, <laughs> kind of vague. <clears throat> so is it related to your thesis? Is there a deadline? So that will actually push up your score, that if it's a thesis, we'll come out of it, that, that actually helps. Fill in the abstract. Uh, don't blow this off. This is where the reviewer first gets his impression because it, you, know, you, you get tired after reading 20 of them. That you, you just want to get a basic idea. What are you talking about? You, know, can you, you should be able to say in a few sentences why is this important. So uh, 
you know, the science impact on a, uh, in the abstract is probably the most important criteria for your score, at least when I, on the panels that I've been on. And so do put in figures or publications from previous work, and it shows that you made previous good use of beam time. Uh, but don't put in a big 20 pages of supplemental stuff. But, and figures help a lot, because if you show a picture of your, your equipment that you've got or a sample that's kind of neat or something like that, it's easy to look at pretty pictures and not read you know, 10 pages of text. So uh, I'd say make it, think of the reviewer as you're writing the proposal. Um, so if you, you've got to put in your uh, collaborators, so they have a little find button. You can actually find people and not have to type in their name. And I say list everybody, even the theorists. And so the theorists who you're collaborating with are actually part of the experiment. And that shows you've got to support. You're actually going to do something with the data. So even if the guy isn't coming and it's just a theorist, uh, <laughs> even, they, even theorists are useful. So, so uh, and then I would say note the guidance on these different sections. So it says limit 500 words. So to me, that means don't write one sentence or don't try to write a thousand words. It, they give you some idea. This is how much we want to read. And so uh, try to hit somewhere around four or 500 words. Uh, and so I'd say also do not use undefined jargon or acronyms. Don't assume the reviewer knows what you're talking about because there's so many different areas you got to review things on that I don't know your details. I mean, I've reviewed things on fish scales and you know, tree rings and all sorts of stuff that I don't know anything. They got to give me the basics of, like if you're talking to your uncle at a, you know, who's an engineer, he might be able to understand this is why you're doing what you're doing, but he may not know exactly your field. Uh, so you got to give background information. Why is it important? You know, science at the facility is very diverse. And there, as I said, the reviewer is not necessarily an expert on your subject. Try to capture his imagination. Try to get him to uh, say, oh, this is really neat. Uh, each committee gets many proposals. <laughs> so you, it needs to be clear. If it's murky and not well written, if English isn't your first language, get somebody to help. Uh, they try to read quickly many pages. Uh, state clearly what you want to measure and how you're going to measure it. So it gives some details, enough like temperature range or your x-ray, what you want to do, your geometry, uh, to, to prove, yeah, I'm ready to do this, but not so much that you get bored by, oh, here's all the different angles and everything. You don't need to know that. So they need to know if it's feasible. So does the x-ray energy match the, you know, your penetration depth or you know, percent of dilute atoms? I mean, I've had proposals where you know, they're looking for a tiny number of atoms and they just aren't going to get any signal. And so you have to know these kind of numbers roughly. Uh, why use x-rays or neutrons? And so it's worth knowing what has been done with other techniques, TEM, Mossbauer, laser, Raman, or whatever, because there are sometimes it's better to do it with those or at least do it with those first. So if you've done it with first with those, you say, well, now we really know and we need to use neutrons and x-rays. Uh, you have to justify the amount of beam time requested. And, and so that, you know, if you don't have an idea how long things take, just ask the instrument scientist and be reasonable about it. So it, when you actually make the request for each cycle, you got to do it at APS. Uh, the SNS, they are one shot anyway. But at APS, they're valid for two years. And you need to remember to put it in the request each cycle. Because if you forget to do that, it won't come up again. So I've had people very upset assuming that it was aging along, and it didn't because it doesn't get counted unless you actually resubmit it every cycle. And it helps if you can choose multiple beam lines, if, if it's possible. And for times that you can come, be, hopefully be flexible and say you can come a lot of the time. Uh, if you need a special environment, make sure you put that in there because if you show up and they don't have the big Pilatus detector or the right cryostat or something, that's going to be a problem. They need to schedule that stuff a lot, of, uh, in, a lot in advance often. So what the ratings are is on a number scale, supposedly one to five, where it's great and poor. And, but the average score is more like two, 2.2, 2, something like that. And so the cutoff score for getting beam time varies different beam time, somewhere around 1.4 uh, to 2.2, 2, something like that. There's one nice feature, I think, at APS where you have aging. And the score improves by 0.2 each cycle up to twice. So you can get 0.04. And I think that's a smart thing because the error bar in the reviews are bigger than 0.2. So this helps uh, you, know, you eventually get beam time uh, if that's uh, if you just need a little bit of time to age and get there. Uh, 
And so long-term planning is needing, but you have to remember to request the beam time in order to get this aging. Otherwise, it doesn't even get uh, considered for beam time. So at the APS, uh, a couple of years ago, they actually expanded. It used to be only these uh, five panels here, and now they expanded. They have more users, and so there are more possibilities. And they actually give you at this web page who's on these panels. And so it's important to pick the right panel to review. You get to uh, actually put that in your proposal. And so if, if you know somebody here hates your professor, probably try to find a different panel, <laughs> something like that. And you, know, and you can kind of tell by who's on it whether it, it you know, uh, really is related to your field or not. It used to be this uh, imaging microbeam. We ran a microbeam beam line, but that had to do with fluorescence. So everybody on that panel was for fluorescence, and they didn't know what we were doing. And it really turned out for us the scattering applied materials was a better panel. So knowing what the panels are, who's on it, what, it, what kind of things do they review uh, is useful. Uh, some places are more transparent than others. ALS gives you uh, a plot for the different beam lines. What are the cutoff scores? And so this shows you <laughs> that it's really kind of a Lake Wobegon effect here where the medium priority, the kind of average score, you know, you're way out in the tail here. You're, you're actually a poor <laughs> uh, rating. And so it's only the ones up to a certain number, typically around here someplace, will get beam time. And they give you a table of what is the cutoff of different beam lines. So the ones that have a high number for a cutoff are easier to get beam times at, and the ones that have a low number are harder. So SNS and Heifer doesn't tell you a number score. And I've, I've recommended to them that they do tell you that, but uh, and I have had it where the user office would tell me my score if I asked for it. So I don't know what they're doing now, but I, I think that's a good thing to do is to be a little more transparent and tell people uh, this is how it works. I mean, I think they don't want to have people argue, well, I should have got a little bit better score and things. And um, so it's a, it's a tough thing and it's not perfect, but I think uh, it works reasonably well. And, the, and it's usually clear if you got a very good proposal, eventually you'll get beam time. So here's some tips is give a very concise explanation of this specific proposal. And so background uh, of importance, the bigger picture, but then sort of you know, come down to your particular study, why that's a key uh, part of uh, advancing the field. So people have talked about this hourglass view of proposals. You start out with this grandiose field that is important, and then here is the bottlenecks, and here's where my experiment's gonna really make an impact, and then it's gonna be so important that everybody's gonna follow me and it's gonna become a huge field. So that's kind of the hourglass view of proposals, and that's a good way to do it, to have all of those components in it. Uh, and because the reviewer wants to assess the likelihood of success in a bigger impact for a small experiment. So that's one way to do it. Include relevant details to the experiment, but don't get too verbose. Uh, the reviewer needs to judge uh, not only the scientific importance, but whether you can do it, whether it's uh, feasible. And as I keep saying is talk to the instrument scientists. They're your best resource. Find out about the details, the subscription, uh, over subscription rate, things like that. And even maybe send them the proposal ahead of time and ask them for advice. And I would consider it a collaboration. If you have some previous results from experiments, include them, just mention them. Uh, you know, if you've characterized it already, you know some information about it, put that in there. Take advantage of the aging, so you have to plan ahead. And I would say, if you're getting rushed at the end and it's the night before and you try to get it in, don't bother submitting it because I would claim a bad proposal it will hurt you in the long run because it's the same panel that does it for a couple of years. They're going to say, uh, this guy wrote a crappy proposal. Uh, you don't want to get a bad reputation. Uh, and there are some excellent famous scientists who think they can blow it off. And we did not give them good scores <laughs> if it just if you write a bad proposal. Uh, here's some common pitfalls. The proposer uh, assumes the committee is familiar with their specialty. They're not. They're, you, your specialty is very special. So uh, explain the impact. The proposer uh, writes a large, general, vague proposal, looking, asking for lots of time. It's better to write a shorter proposal with very, you know, they want to know what are you really going to do. They don't want to say we're going to go study this kind of material. They want to know I'm going to measure this, this is going to tell me that, and that's going to answer this burning question. So be realistic. The proposer submits two or more similar proposals for related materials, thinking that multiple proposal increases their chances. The reviewers may not like that. If you have the same proposal with just two samples, they don't want, they, they're probably angry they had to read two proposals rather than just putting one in that had two materials. 
So uh, the proposal deadline for the next level is scheduled before uh, uh, beam time this, uh, I'm not sure what that point means. But anyway, uh, some common reviewer comments is they can improve their score by having some more details uh, or previous results and expanding things. Sometimes you just don't give enough information. And another killer thing is trying to put in for per, you know, uh, beam time for something been published already and thinking, well, I'm just going to get some future beam time. Don't do that. Uh, a lot of times they ask for too many cycles. And so if, they, if you haven't published much in the last couple of years and you ask for a lot of shifts, they're not going to be favorable towards that. The proposer should perform initial characterization with lab source. So if you don't really know a lot about your sample, you better be ready to show up with the right sample. Uh, and they're not very sympathetic if people say, well, we thought we'd have our sample ready, but we just, we're not quite ready. So after you submit it, then you, it'll take some time. They've got to go through their reviews and revisions. And then uh, it'll be several weeks uh, after the cl uh, call closes. They'll give you, a, a, hopefully, a score, tell you where they get beam time. And that's when you're ready to schedule your experiment. And make sure you take all the required training, all that. that particularly APS, electrical safety, is very important. They had some incidents uh, previously. You probably heard about that. Um, Make sure you got your samples ready. That um, you know, scientists don't always have everything ready on time, and that that's a, a bad thing to do. If you ca need to cancel beam time, that won't help you in the future. Uh, consider the reviewer comments if you don't get a, a beam time, and uh, hopefully then resubmit the proposal, really directly addressing whatever the comments were. And there are opportunities in different facilities, different beam lines, and that continues to grow. So uh, there's lots of scientific and funding opportunities. So I guess I'd like some of these have been mentioned before. But now that you're a student, uh, the first step is to attend a neutron and x-ray school. OK, check that one off. Uh, because I mean, it really is the knowledge and these connections have a long-term impact in science. I mean, I still, when I go to Argonne and I need a furnace or something, the guys I knew in grad school, I can go to their lab and do something. So, uh, science is a collaborative effort. That unless you're, uh, I don't know, a theoretical genius and sit in your office by yourself, you really need to have collaborators and work with them. Uh, join the SNS uh, Hyper User Group and other facility organizations. Uh, these are advocacy groups that uh, the postdoc or grad student talked about on Monday, I guess, and learn about. And you can learn about what the new developments are. So if there's a new capability, a new beam line, you'll know about that. Uh, you can explore these. There's lots of opportunities in terms of DOE and NS NSF internships, fellowships, and research programs. So this one's a scientific uh, something graduate student research program, CISCR they call them. Uh, here's the website. Uh, that's for spending a couple months working at a national lab or something, and that's kind of a growing, uh, that's a very good opportunity. Uh, each lab, like for Oak Ridge, there's this ORAU, ROWIS, uh, you know, uh, type of opportunities for summer work and things like that through here or go and with these kind of things the local contacts help a lot and so if you know some scientists or if your advisor knows some scientists at a national lab find out about all these opportunities and it helps your advisor that sometimes there's money available they, then your advisor doesn't have to pay you and he likes that and so uh, that actually there's quite a few more opportunities now than there were in the past. Another way you can do is go the other way and invite scientists or BeamLine staff from the national labs to your campus. Say you want to come and give a seminar or something like that, then they'll you know, like to go and interact and do that kind of thing. So then, so this is as for now when you're a grad student, but eventually, hopefully, you'll be a young professional. Hopefully, you'll get out of grad school and you have a PhD and everything and postdoc and, uh, well, I don't know. I'm not promising that, but, uh, you know. Uh, so anyway, I would say continue free of charge user facilities, even though they're not really free of charge, but new faculty and industrial users and things like that are usually favored in their views. If there's some new group starting up, they want to help them get beam time. Uh, one good way is really to be volunteer to be a reviewer on these panels. Uh, the best way to learn how to, what a good and bad proposal is to read a couple hundred of them, and after you did that, then you really have a pretty good idea. Uh, there are also some EPSCOR programs that if you're located in EPSCOR state, and I'll show a map of that in a minute. Uh, you can also later, uh, after your couple of years, apply for an early career award. I'll tell a little bit more about that. That's really great for a tenure application. That seems to be a, uh, a growing program. 
So for EPSCoR, what they have is a special program for states that don't have quite as much federal funding for research. So it's about 24 states now, but it changes with time. Tennessee used to be one, but isn't now. Uh, but if you're in one of these states and you're a starting out faculty member, there are special EPSCoR grants that help you get started and things like that. Um, then I mentioned the early career research program. Um, so uh, this is again for your future and it's very good for tenure. And the idea is again to support new starting out early career researchers and both DOE and NSF have this kind of program and it's within 10 years of getting your PhD uh, it, and you cannot be tenured. Um, and they also have it for the national lab employees also, but you can't do it when you're a postdoc. And so this shows the ratio of how much it costs to be at a university versus national lab. The university guys get 150K a year for five years and the national lab guys get 500K per year because that's about an equivalent amount of money. The overhead is much higher at a national lab. Uh, so when it started, they had 69 awards and now let's see they had, uh, that was just the first year to get it going. Now they do it every year and they add some. And so this year they just added 59 scientists. They typically have something like 700 applications. I'm not quite sure of that number. Uh, but this year is 20 at national labs and 39 at universities. So there were four here at Oak Ridge. And so that's a really good way to get started. You get guaranteed funding for five years. Just go do research and uh, don't worry about funding proposals for a while. And so usually the pre applications in September. Um, and so, and a lot of people, uh, these science talks have ended with references for their technique and everything. And so what are the references for writing proposals, writing grants, being a scientist? And so I, one thing that I found very useful has been these basic research needs workshops. And so back uh, quite a while ago, maybe 2002, DOE uh, had a commission, a panel of scientists get together and they had a basic research needs uh, to, to assure a secure energy future. And they really liked this. This is sort of a blueprint for what are we gonna do, what's important, what's scientifically the future, things like that. So it's different than a regular review article or a regular journal article, you know, it, it, but it has the kind of language that you're going to have in your proposals, both for beam time and for funding, is it's more what are the possibilities? What would be the impact on science? What would be the impact on the whole world, on you know, economics, on uh, health, on anything? And so they've had 50 reports in the last 20 years. And so everything ranging from superconductors to uh, 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 ammonia to uh, experimental tools and so they often have them like x-ray optics for BES light sources or what's the next generation of light sources things like that uh, computing and so I would go and go look through them if you're writing a report and if there is one on your topic it's a good resource for that kind of language of what kind of things are people talking about uh, and so as far as the user facilities this is sort of how this whole process happened. Before I mentioned they spend about $200 million a year, but they have to have a process for figuring which 200 million are we gonna spend five years from now. And so like back in 2003, they had a BSAC evaluation of facilities for the future. And it's interesting to look back, the ones they were talking about that were under construction, they're now all operating. The SNS was uh, underway, being built back then. And so the ones that uh, were just sort of, uh, the talking about writing proposals about are mostly operating now also. And the ones that were mentioned, uh, not all of them are actually built now. For example, the Splatian neutron source is now delayed. The advanced photon light source was men mentioned back there. They've been trying for a long time, 15 years, and they've restarted it three different times. It was an energy recovery LINAC for a while. Then it was a ultra fast short pulse uh, upgrade plan. Now it's the multi-band Acromat plan, which I think actually is the best one of the three, but it's this whole process. It's not just this nice, yeah, we just keep doing the obvious next thing. It's a bunch of people arguing my technique's more important than your technique and oh no, we ought to do it this way. We ought to have this energy, whatever. That's a process that you guys, that hopefully, you know, 15 or 20 years from now will be uh, intimately involved with. So this is the latest upgrade, a BSAC report on facility upgrades for 2016. They have five uh, possible facilities and they rated them under how central they are, uh, you know, to science and whether they're ready to go. And so these are all the competing choices these panels have to deal with. Do you want a storage ring or free electron laser? 
And now the APS and ESR are, are based on this multi-bend Acromat lattice. Uh, they did have an ERL, Energy Recovery LINAC, and that's part of some of the ideas. They put some of those ideas. What kind of repetition rate do you, is optimal? Do you want hard or soft x-rays? What do you want? For a spallation source, what's the rep rate? What's the you know, trade-offs between the rep rate and the resolution? Uh, neutron target, they've had lifetime issues in the past. Are they really confident they'll be able to last a long lifetime? What are the power options? Obviously, you want power, uh, but you don't want to burn up your targets. So those are all the hard questions that uh, you know, some of you hopefully will be able to uh, have some impact on that. And I'm not quite sure what they will be. And it extends to all fields, even the more scientific fields, they have the same kind of questions. And so I'd say in terms of uh, facilities and synchrotrons, my personal feeling is that detectors are going to be one of the big growth areas that hopefully uh, you can get big gains if you have big megapixel area detectors and hopefully with energy resolution and you can increase the power of a beamline a lot that way and it's often cheaper to do it that way. So those are the kind of things that people have to think about and it is really just people thinking about it. It's not some magic obvious way to do things. So the impact of these big scientific user facilities has really grown significantly in the past 25 years. It really was a pretty minor thing when I was a grad student, and now it's more than half the BES budget, 55% uh, of the BES budget, and will continue. And they have powerful new techniques, but the researchers, which hopefully means you in the future, uh, have to drive the science. So you need some good science. You need a lot of enthusiasm, politics. Uh, we didn't get the uh, reactor source here because uh, Al Gore didn't support it, even though he was from Tennessee. So, and luck and perseverance. So I say good luck and have fun doing it. And are there any questions? <clears throat> yeah? Okay, the question is how uh, common is it for the reviewers to recommend using a different beam line or use something, uh, some other facility or something? And I say that's not very common because hopefully most proposal writers have figured that out, that they, which beam line, but it does happen. So I'd say that there are some where they're you know, using the wrong technique even. Uh, and, but more likely I would say we would say you do some homework first. Like if you got a sample that the TEM would tell you about the short range order more quickly uh, and it's a lot more accessible, you need to do your homework first. So more, but yeah, it'd be a good thing to do and you pick the right beam line, but maybe you needed to characterize your sample a little bit more, some other technique first. Yeah, yeah, the, the beamline staff know what else is around the ring, and they may be connected to more than one ring. So lately I've been doing inelastic x-ray scattering in both sector 30 and 3 do inelastic x-ray scattering, and they have different strengths and weaknesses. So it helps if I list both of them and I know ahead of time that I'm sending it to the right one and I know the reasons why, but if I do make a mistake, they may pick that up and they may say, well, you should have sent it to sector three. So a lot of times the reviewers and the BMA and staff will fix a mistake, uh, but it helps to show that you're an expert user that comes in and knows what you're doing if you get that straightened out ahead of time and talk to the beamline staff. And they, they will know all the details uh, about what beamlines can do what. And it also, particularly for the techniques that are less specialized, like inelastic x-ray scattering is kind of specialized and only a couple of beamlines can do it. But things like XAFs and powder and general uh, three, three, you know, uh, triple axis diffractometer, uh, like 33 BM, there's probably other beamlines that can do that. Uh, so knowing those kind of things are useful. And what is the special case on different beamlines? So for example, 33 BM, that's not run full time uh, because they don't have enough beamline staff. So there's some idle time that if you're an expert user, I've actually gotten some beam time where they say, we're not giving you any support, but we'll let you just run uh, because that way they get to check off a user without providing any uh, support or something. So there's lots of details. And that's sort of my message is this whole process is people interacting with other people and knowing which beamlines are available, what is good science, what will sell, communicating the importance of your topic, all those things are really uh, 
uh, you know, just human interactions. It's not just I got these great equations, this great sample. Uh, it's not pure science in that sense. It's a, <laughs> it's a uh, interaction. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it, yes. The question is, is it okay to ask for beam time on complementary instruments? And definitely, that's actually a plus. If you can use uh, two beam times, some kind of spectroscopy, along with some structural determination on the same sample, uh, different facilities probably approach that differently. But I, uh, I haven't done that, but I would think uh, they would encourage that. And I, I'm thinking the ones I've seen, I have seen it, for example, ALS, uh, they've asked for beam time on two different uh, beam lines. So that takes a little bit more coordination, but it's not a problem. Um, and more common, what happens is uh, have something connected with one of the nanoscience centers and a scattering facility. They're supposed to be connected and tied. <coughs> and so it does, that is actually a plus. If you're using both their nanoscience center to make a sample and then a use scattering facility to characterize it, that is sort of a plus. You're using two, fa two parts of a national lab. <laughs> yes. <coughs> yes, that's a that's a tough question because yeah, you're playing, you're bouncing your odds. That if you have better odds of getting it on a beam line, it's not quite as good. Do you go for that or do you go for the lower chance of getting beam time? And so uh, again, that's where I would talk to the staff uh, and find out. And it, it kind of helps to know then what is the cutoff score exactly on that beam line. APS is pretty cut and dry. They have a number and they can tell you if you get this number and then, because then you might age into it. If you don't mind waiting a couple of cycles, you might age into getting beam time for a heavily subscribed uh, beam line. But that's a tough one. It's sort of like the, the stock market. Do you put your money into a high risk stock that may tank or do you put it in, a, you know, in the bank and get a little bit of interest? I mean, these, these are, how do you play it? How risky? Yeah, I mean, I, there is no one answer, but talking to the facility is the best way to get more insight on it. <clears throat>